All right, everyone, we're live. I think I went live about 13 seconds early or something like that. But I just want to give people a second to join and and uh, and and kind of join the stream. I'm really excited about this. So the reason that I'm doing this today, it was kind of an off the cuff decision I made yesterday. I was originally supposed to be doing a live stream on a different channel today, and I was very excited about it. But then yesterday, it got postponed at the last minute uh, due to a scheduling conflict. And so I had this time in the afternoon free. And I was like, well, I was supposed to back in the day when there were still in-person events happening. I was actually supposed to be at an event giving this playing politics presentation uh, in front of an audience of people. And, and one of the things I do professionally is I am a speaker. I go to conferences and workshops and all this stuff. And I do speaking. Um, and the playing politics presentation that I'm going to do today it's actually the most popular presentation that I give. It's all about the psychology of office politics. And so I am very excited. I thought, you know, why, why the heck not, right? Why not just jump on YouTube and give the presentation and maybe you'll help some people and maybe, maybe they'll enjoy it. So that's what we're going to do today is we are going to do my playing politics presentation. But before, before I jump right into it, guys, please just send a note into the chat if you can see me, if you can hear me, if, okay, it looks like, it looks like things are working. Fantastic. Now, I will be keeping an eye on the chat as we go through our presentation. Um, yes, yeah, someone just said in the chat, please hit the thumbs up button, guys, if you if you, if you you like this, if you like the information uh, as we work our way through the presentation. If you aren't convinced yet to give me a thumbs up, but I convince you during the presentation, please hit that thumbs up for me. It really does help me out. So let me just get the presentation up on the screen. All fancy like we've got our PowerPoint slides for today. Um, all right, everyone. So I'm just going to jump right into it. Listen, I am going to be taking questions throughout it. But but I'm I you know, so please feel free to ask questions at any time. I'll do my very best to get all to all the questions I can. Uh, if you are in my locals community, I know some of you in the chat are in my locals community. And I'll talk more about that in a sec. If you aren't, but if you're in my locals community, there is actually a post that's pinned to the top right now. That will be the very first place that I look for questions. I know a couple of you have already asked me questions in there. So that's going to be the very first place I look when I'm taking questions. The very second place I'm going to look is going to be the super chats because they're easiest for me to see. And I will do my very best to follow along with what's going on in the chat. But you guys also do want me just in presentation mode. So I really won't be paying too much attention to the chat throughout the presentation. But I'll do my very best to get to everyone's question. All right, let's jump into it, shall we? Now, welcome to Playing Politics, the Psychology of the Human Workplace. I think most of you, hang on, slide's not advancing. Okay, I think most of you know who I am, but just in case you happen to stumble on this channel, you were like, oh, the psychology of office politics, that sounds cool. Well, let me just do a little introduction of myself. We're gonna call me Dr. Carlin Borisenko for the purpose of this presentation, because we're gonna be all professional-like for this presentation. So I'm Dr. Carlin Borisenko. I'm an organizational psychologist. I work with individuals and teams all over the world to help create better work experiences. My PhD is in psychology. My focus is industrial and organizational psychology. I also have an MBA just to round out that businessy knowledge. I contribute to a bunch of places. I do a bunch of stuff. That's who I am. Let's get into it. So actually, before we get into it, guys, so just so you know, so um, the, the the I don't I don't want to guilt anyone here, but but I have actually lost a significant amount of business due to what's going on in the world with the coronavirus. A lot of my income comes in through in-person trainings, development, workshop, things like that. And so uh, part of the reason I'm doing this is just so you guys know, if you have the means and are inclined to support the work I'm doing with the content and all of this stuff, there are several ways that you can do that. I'm just going to pimp those out real quick, and then we're going to get into the good stuff. One of the ways you can do that is by joining my brand new community on Locals. Locals is a place where you can get my videos ad free. So if you like my videos on YouTube, join the Locals community and you will get them ad free. I upload them at exactly the same time 
We also do discussions. We do daily discussions in the community. We're going to do a book club. We're going to do a debate club, all sorts of awesome things that, that we're doing behind kind of a subscription model to kind of keep the trolls away. If you want, anyone can join. It is free to join. But if you want to participate in the discussions and the activities, it is $5 a month to get started. And if you join using the promo code welcome, you get your first month for free. So that's pretty awesome. Join me there at kb.locals.com. Other ways that you can support me and the work that I'm doing is by joining on Subscribestar. There are all different tiers there. And my favorite way lately, guys, my absolute favorite way is my merch store, which I've got linked up hopefully in the description below. I've got awesome merchandise in the store, including the my body, my choice, mask, t-shirt, tank top, whatever. I've also got cool t-shirts with the quote, I prefer dangerous freedom over peaceful slavery. And the brand new thing that I literally just got added to my merch store like an hour ago is this awesome Handmaid's Tale Red. This is to silence you neck gator. Because if you're going to wear a mask for like, you guys know, like if you follow me, I think the mask thing is really not emotionally healthy, to be honest. Um, So, but you know, you got to play the game that brought you. And I did create a little mask that you can get in the store. Uh, Teespring right now is doing a promotion for 10% off all merchandise using that promo code through tomorrow. So please check that out. And I really do appreciate everyone that has bought something or has supported me through one of the mediums. I don't want anyone to do it if you're feeling financially strapped because I really am fine at the end of the day, but it, it absolutely does help me out. Okay. And thank you to Paul Grant for the first super chat of the day. I really appreciate it, Paul. But let's get into it, shall we? Let's talk about the subject at hand, which is office politics. Everyone's favorite thing to do. Now, listen, even when we are working in traditional office environments, you know what no one says ever? I can't wait to get up in the morning and go play office politics. It's going to be awesome. And this was actually one of the questions I got in my locals group was, Carlin, how can organizations minimize office politics? politics. The problem comes from how we're defining it. Because a lot of people, when they hear the phrase office politics, they have this visceral negative reaction to what that means. They think that it's all bad. But I'm here to tell you that office politics is not, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's also not something that you can ever escape from if you work in a traditional office environment. And that's true when you're working in environments in person. It is even more true, quite frankly, when you're working virtually from home. Office politics still exists, even if you aren't in the office. And for most people, what they need to understand is that organizations are much more political then you probably realize, and I'm sure many of you, when you're when you're going into work, you think, I'm not going to play office politics. I'm going to keep my head down and do my work, and that's how I'm going to be successful, and that's how I'm going to get ahead. And that is exactly the wrong answer, because here is the thing, folks. Just because you are choosing not to play office politics, everyone around you still is. And when you opt out of the system, you are setting it up where people who are not as smart as you and not as talented as you are going to get promoted ahead of you. And no one wants that, right? You want to be able to take advantage of all the good work that you're putting in. So that's kind of like, that's one reason to think about office politics in a little bit more of a productive way. But I want to give you an even better reason. Because, you know, sometimes you can use the carrot and some Sometimes you can use the stick when you're trying to motivate people. That, I just use the stick. But let's talk about the carrot because that's honestly a lot more interesting. When you play office politics, you can become a change agent in your organization because playing politics will help you to do more. It will help you to accomplish your goals. It will help you to get things done. And what we need to start doing is wrapping our head around the idea that office politics is not necessarily evil. It's not. It gets a bad reputation because most people don't understand it. And oftentimes it's very easy for us to become afraid of the things we don't understand, but it's not necessarily an evil thing. In fact, you might want to think of it as the unspoken rules of the workplace, the thing that is always there, has always been there, will always be there no matter what. And here's the thing, just because rules exist doesn't mean you have to like the rules. 
It doesn't. It doesn't mean you have to like them, but you do have to understand them. Because if you're making the choice to go into a traditional workplace, then then this is the game you are going to have to play in order to be as successful and as accomplished as you want to be. And here's the thing, folks. When I'm talking about office politics, I'm not talking about an ideal. I'm not talking about an ideal world of rainbows and unicorns and kumbaya and all those things that that people think because that's not realistic. That's not what we're going for. What I'm talking about is how the brain is hardwired to work. That's what this presentation is about, how your brain is hardwired to work. And what I'm referring to is going to be true of you. It's going to be true of me. It's going to be true of your husband, wife, partner, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, grandma, grandpa, unless you are a zombie. What I'm going to teach you in this presentation is going to apply to you because presumably every single one of you is a living, breathing human being with a fully functional brain. And it might help to use to change the words we're using when we're talking about office politics. It might help to think of politics, politics, as influence. And we always need to be able to influence the people that we're working with. And when we're talking about influence, oftentimes the best thing that you can do is think about adapting your behavior in your work environment depending on who you're talking to and depending on the situation that you are in. And if you're honest with yourself, you probably adapt your behavior all the time. We behave differently at home than we do at work. Even if you're working from home, it's, it's so funny to watch my husband in this environment because he definitely behaves differently when he's talking to his coworkers on his computer when they're video chatting than when he does for me too. So he's adapting his behavior there. We also might adapt our behavior when we go to church. We might adapt our behavior when we go to our kid's school. We behave differently in different environments. And so thinking about Adapting your behavior in a tr in into more specific situations in the office, it's really no different than adapting your behavior in any other type of scenario. And I promise you, when you do it, you're going to be more effective, you're going to get more done, and you are going to be a whole lot happier. All right. So in order to understand office politics, I have five principles that we are going to work our way through. These principles are the keys to the kingdom. Folks, I have been teaching this presentation and this content for, oh gosh, a lot of years now. And I promise you, I've seen this work in the real world over and over and over again. Again, it doesn't matter if you're working virtually or working in person. This information works in both environments, but we have to really internalize these principles and think about different ways that we can apply them. So principle number one, People are not logical and rational. This is the very first thing we need to wrap our heads around. People are not logical and rational. I, I know I have a lot of conservatives on this channel. Probably the most of the people in my audience right now are conservatives. And here's the thing that I hear you guys say is conservatives, people on the right, they make decisions rationally using logic. And people on the left, they make decisions using emotions. Eh, 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 eh. You think you do, but you don't. And I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you because listen, we all desperately want people to be logical and rational beings. But I think there's probably deep down inside of you a little bitty piece of you that knows that that is absolutely not the case. Crazier49 says, she says so much so far and yet nothing at all. Well, you got to be patient, man. There's an intro to the presentation. See, I am watching the chat, guys. I am absolutely watching. We're having a little fun today. All right, so we we also know logically that this is not the case. And listen, that's not to say that people don't use data or logic or reason when they're making their decisions. It's just that they use it to justify what they've already decided to do. And usually that's on an unconscious basis. It's called confirmation bias. And I want to teach you about how that works. But in order to do that, 
I'm going to tell you a little story. Tell you a little story, that, and then I'm going to explain very high level how our brain is hardwired to work. So several years ago, again, when life was still normal, I was going to a conference in Austin, Texas, and I kind of showed up at the airport at 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning, and I was still doing my PhD at the time. I was finishing up my coursework, and I realized when I looked in my bag that the only book I had had the foresight to bring with me was an advanced quantitative research textbook. And as thrilling as advanced quantitative research is, it was not what I wanted to read at like 9am on a Sunday morning. So went to the airport bookstore, got your typical kind of paperback bestseller, got on the plane, sat down next to this really, really nice looking older gentleman. And he was on the phone with his wife, and they were still laughing and joking. And, you know, it's clearly the spark was still there after however many years they have been together. And I kind of sat down and smiled and opened my book and started reading couple minutes later, he has to hang up his phone and he turns to me and he strikes up a conversation. And a couple minutes into that, he says, oh, what are you reading? Well, I have to tell you guys, I don't really embarrass easily, but I may have turned a shade or two of pink when I showed him my copy of Fifty Shades of Grey and confessed that I was reading smut. And he was a good natured dude and he kind of laughed and he took out his copy of the Wall Street Journal and pointed to not one, not two, but three stories in a single issue of the Wall Street Journal that were about men in high level government positions having affairs on their wives and getting caught and having to resign those positions because of it. And he said, look, I'm reading smut too. Now, what does any of that have to do with office politics? Nothing. Not a damn thing. But now, if you've been paying attention, I know that you're focused in. I know that you're hearing me. And I know that because of how the brain is hardwired to work. Now, we want to think about the, our brain for the purpose of this experiment in three different parts. And yes, for all you neuroscientists who happen to be watching this, I am aware that I'm about to grossly oversimplify something, but that's what I'm going to do anyway because it is an analogy. And you guys just need to understand the basics. You don't need to understand all the nuance and all that stuff. We we just need the basics. We need to get down to brass tacks. So we want to think of our brain as divided into three different parts. The old brain, the midbrain, and the new brain. The old brain was the very first part of our brain to develop way, 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 way back when we were cavemen. And it is interested in three things. It is interested in food, survival, and sex. And that's it. And it is constantly scanning our environment, looking for those three things. And when it finds those three things, it perks up, bing, like a dog that has just seen a bone. And it says, pay attention to this. This is important. Now, as our old brain is scanning our environment on a consistent basis, it is doing this subconsciously. So you are not aware of all of the information that is coming into your brain on an ongoing basis. In fact, we process 11 million pieces of information in our brain every single second. How insane is that? 11 million pieces of information coming into our brain every single second. Our brain is really like the best supercomputer in the world. Of that 11 million pieces of information, we are only aware of a very, 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 very tiny, tiny, tiny little fraction of that information. We're only aware of about 40 pieces of it. So just keep that in mind. Will you like keep in mind 11 million pieces come in? We are consciously aware of 40 of those pieces. So that is a huge disconnect, right? We we have much more information in our brain than we are aware of in our conscious thought processes. Now, I guarantee you that every single one of you watching this has experienced this at one point or another. Think about a time, again, when the world was still normal, where you left work at the end of the day and got went out to the parking lot, got into your car, drove home, pull into the driveway, and you don't remember driving home. Has that happened to anyone? Think about it, like chat in if that's happened to you, where you drive home from somewhere, you take the same route you've taken a million times before, you pull into the driveway and you're like, what happened? How did I get here? Did you fall asleep? 
No, I don't think you did. You didn't fall asleep. You made it home. Everything was safe, but your brain kind of shut off and it went on to autopilot, right? Now, what would have happened is if you were driving home and a dog had run out in front of your car, what's going to happen is you're going to feel a jolt of energy through your body. Your brain's going to wake you right up. It's going to say, danger, 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 hit the brake. This is important. That's your old brain at work. Okay, it identified something that was going to impact your survival because you hit the dog, you can get in an accident, go off the road, and, and that's not so good. So your own brain jolted you to attention, sent a rush of energy through your body to wake you up. That's an example of that. Now, our old brain tries really, really hard to make all of our decisions for us. But sometimes, and this is particularly true when it comes to the work environment, sometimes we actually have to make decisions that don't relate to food, survival, or sex, right? Because if you're making decisions based on food, survival, or sex when it comes to work, you're you're probably in some trouble and you probably, you know, should should definitely don't talk to HR about that, but that's not where you want to be, right? Most of our decisions, particularly at work, do not involve any of those three things. And so what we have to do, what your old brain does in those environments is it has to consult a friend and it consults the midbrain. Now the midbrain is where we process all of our emotion. So how, where we're feeling happy or sad or anxious or depressed or excited or proud or whatever that might be, that's processed in our midbrain. Just like the old brain, the midbrain is a subconscious part of the brain. So we are not always aware of what of how we feel the way we do or why we feel that way. An example of that is is <laughs> Dragon Water says what about porn stars? Um what are, you got to be more specific with that question Dragon Water. Um, so, so we're not always aware of why we feel the way we do. An example I like to give of this, and, and my husband really appreciates this, is sometimes I will be, guys, think about when you're having a fight with your partner, your spouse, husband, wife, whatever it is, and, and you, you're like in this fight. This is one of those like important fights where you're really fired up and you just want to keep going and like almost like you would prefer to keep fighting than to find any resolution for it. And so this, this every once in a while happens with me and my husband. And when it does, I, I kind of reach a point with the fighting where I'm like midpoint and I'm like trying to give him the business. And all of a sudden, I forget why I was upset in the first place. That's an example of, of our midbrain because it's a subconscious part of our brain. Now, Another thing that the midbrain processes is nonverbal cues. So maybe this is a better example for this. Maybe think of a time where you've been in a workplace or frankly with your family or what have you. Think of a time when you've walked into a room and before anyone has said anything, you know something is wrong. Think about that. Does that happen to you before? Chat in if that's happened to you before. You just walk into a room, no one has said anything, and you just know with every fiber of your being that something is wrong. That is our midbrain. That's where our gut instincts come from, folks. And if you're honest with yourself, a lot of times those gut instincts tend to be correct. So you should always follow your gut instincts. What's happening when you're getting a gut instinct is your brain is processing a whole ton of information and it's delivering you an answer. It's just not telling you how it got there. All right. So we have our old brain sorted out with our survival. We have our midbrain sorted out with our emotions. And then we get to the new brain. Then we get to the new brain. And the new brain is what gets us into trouble so, so much at work. Because the new brain is where we process all logic and reason. It is also the only part of the brain that we are consciously aware of. And so what that means is that most of the time when we think we are being logical and rational in our decisions and in our behaviors. We really aren't. It is simply what we are aware of. And all of that leads to the next slide. Now, I'm just going to give you a fair warning. This next slide, this is the one you want to write down. This is the one you want to write down on the sticky note if you're working from home. Put it on the computer monitor and, and refer to it often because it literally will explain every single human problem you have in the workplace. Ready? Okay, here it is. Human beings make decisions emotionally and they justify them rationally. I'm going to say that again. Human beings make decisions emotionally and then they justify them 
rationally. And here's the reason for that. So the new brain where we process all logic and reason, it might be the part of the brain that we are consciously aware of, but if you compare it to the midbrain and the old brain in terms of a decision-making hierarchy, they give it like an organizational chart. The new brain is like the director in the organization, but the midbrain is like the vice president and the old brain is like the CEO. So the new brain can make decisions. You can make decisions through logic and reason. However, it is very, very easy for those decisions to be overruled by your subconscious parts of your brain that dictate emotion and dictate your survival. Human beings make decisions emotionally and they justify them rationally. Now I'm just gonna take a quick pause here and I'm just gonna see if there are any questions about what we've covered so far because this is the big thing. This is the big thing that in order to understand the rest of this presentation, you need to wrap your head around it. So I'm just gonna look in the chat and look at, look at my locals and to see if anyone has asked any questions so far that I can answer. And let me see. Rudiger says, is the office, here, I'll even show it. Is the office really the best place to learn all of this? No, the uh, that's a great question. No, the office is absolutely not the best place to learn all of this. However, this isn't taught in schools. This isn't. When I first created this presentation, honestly, this was a presentation that I wish I had learned when I was like 22 years old because I would have saved myself so many freaking headaches in the office. So no, it's not the best place to learn it, but it's what we have. So, you know. Um, Ruhan says, is so being robotic is good since you switch off your emotions? No, because you don't switch off your emotions. You think you do because your emotions are a subconscious part of your brain, but that doesn't mean you're switching off your emotions. Yeah, so Keith says, and I, I know, I, oh, Kaiser So say, that's what it is. Um, so yeah, I just tuned in. This is not just the office and more of a general socialization thing. Yeah, that is absolutely correct. But can you use it in the office? You bet your butt you can. Absolutely. All right, guys, it looks like I don't have any other questions. Please feel free to chat them in. Again, I'm gonna be taking questions first in local, second from Super Chat, third, anything that's left over in the chat, and I will do my very best to answer everyone's question as well as I can, but let's get back into it. Okay, so if decisions are made emotionally and justified rationally, what that means, and I know you guys are gonna hate me for this one because my YouTube audience hates me for this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. There is no such thing as an objective reality. Why is that? Why is there no such thing as an objective reality? Because we are filtering the information that we are aware of in the conscious part of our brain based on our emotional responses to that information. And what that means is that when we come to the topic of office politics, what you need to understand is that office politics is inherently irrational. It is inherently irrational. If you try to navigate office politics and you are doing it based on the presumption that human beings are logical and rational creatures, I guess, guess what, folks? You are not going to be very successful. And we've known this for a really long time. Ben Franklin knew this. Ben Franklin, who was a consummate inventor of things, right? A very logical person in some parts of his life. He said, would you persuade? Think of interest, not of reason. So when we are playing office politics and we rely solely on data to try to make our arguments, to try to make our case, to try to get people to agree with us, to buy into our decisions, to get resources, to do whatever you want to do. When you rely solely on data, rather than looking at the bigger picture, you will fail every single time. Why? Because emotion will always win out over logic. Always. Every single time. This is how the brain is hardwired to work. Now, you really have one of two choices when it comes to this. You can say, well, no, I'm not going to play this game. Damn the man. I'm not going to do it this way. I'm going to stick to logic and reason and data, and that's just what I'm going to do. That's one choice, but I promise you, if you wrap your head around this, there are ways you can use it to your advantage to get more done, to meet your goals, to be more successful in the work environment. But in order to do that, guess what? 
We need to build relationships because if human beings are making decisions emotionally, then principle number two of office politics is that relationships become your goal. I'm going to say this another way. You need to get people to like you. Yeah, I know about 50% of you are just like, you. it felt like you just took a gut punch right there because you don't you don't want to work on that part of yourself. I know that. That's your work style, man. About 50% of people are when I say you need to get people to like you, you're like, oh, no, I don't want to. But listen, man, listen, think about this logically. Have you like think about think about a leader that you have worked with at any point in your professional experience and you cannot stand this person. It's that boss or that vice president that you absolutely cannot stand this person. Now let's posit that that leader, that person that you hate has come up with the best plan in the history of plans. It is the best, most thought through, cannot miss, will 100% be successful plan. If you don't like that person, you are still going to find ways to poke holes in that plan because your perception of that plan is filtered through your emotional responses. And yeah, in the chat, your guys are saying, I come you're like, no, I don't want to deal with this. I promise you, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Bear with me. Okay. We're going to, we'll work through this together. Now, why is that? Why are relationships our goal in the workplace? Well, a lot of people think that influence in the workplace comes from where you sit in the organizational chart, right? Who do you report to? Who reports to you? Who you can fire? Uh, that that sort of thing, right? They think that organ that influence comes from the org chart. However, and even in the MBA textbooks, if you like read an MBA textbook, it's called legitimate power. The position you hold in the org chart is your legitimate power. But that's bullshit, to be honest, because the organizational chart is actually the weirdest or the, excuse me, the weakest way to influence in your organization. It's weak because it is, it is really difficult to change, takes a long time to change, and it restricts your influence to the silo in the organizational chart that you happen to be in. So it is not a good way to influence. There are better ways to influence. The next best way is to be perceived as an expert. Because if your coworkers perceive you as an expert in something, you are going to be able to influence in that area. However, perceived is the key word here. Perceived is the magic word. So let me ask you this. And listen, I don't, don't feel the need to like answer this. If I was doing this in front of a live audience right now, I would tell people, don't raise your hands if you agree with the question that I'm about to ask you. Just think of it in your head. Don't feel like you need to chat in. But let me ask you this. Have any of you ever worked for a boss that had no godly business being a boss? They had no idea what you were doing. You have no idea why they were hired as a boss in the first place. Does that happen to anyone? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Hang on. I'm going to take a sip of coffee. I'm like on a roll here. Yeah, Coralis says de jure authority versus de facto authority. Yeah, that's, that's pretty dead on, man. So... If you've ever worked for a boss that had no business being hired into their role and crazy 49ers says, who hasn't had that type of boss? Yeah, I've had lots of those bosses, man. The question we need to ask ourselves is how did that person get hired into that position? How did that person get hired into that position if they have no godly business being in that role? Well, guess what? They probably had a relationship with the person doing the hiring. That's usually how that happens. They were friends with the person doing the hiring. Maybe they just had a great interview with the person doing the hiring. They connected on that personal level. And then the person hiring made a decision emotionally about who to put in that role that wasn't necessarily a logical, rational decision. And we've actually known how this works for a really long time. Listen, there was a study that came out 100 years ago, literally 100 years ago, is sponsored by the Carnegie Foundation. And what it found is that 85% of someone's success comes from their soft skills, from the emotional pieces, from their EQ, if you will. Only 15% of it comes from their technical knowledge of how to do the job. And yes, that's true of you more scientific positions and engineers and, and programmers and all that sort of thing. Your success is going to be dependent on how well you play this little game that we're talking about right now. And that's because relationships 
are your secret weapon when you come to the work environment because relationships means that you can influence without that formal structure. It means you can influence outside of your specific silo in the organizational chart. It means you can influence outside of the people who might report up to you. It also means you're tapping in to that emotional part of the brain. Okay. Now, does anyone remember this movie from a couple years ago? Anyone remember this? Type into the chat. Yes. If you remember this movie. If you haven't seen this movie in a while, this movie holds up, man. This movie is still a great movie. So The Imitation Game is a movie about Alan Turing trying to develop a machine to break an unbreakable Nazi code in World War II. Fantastic movie, right? Yeah, Ru Rudiger, you're going to like this movie, man. This, this movie pertains to some of the questions you've asked me. You should watch this movie. So why, why are we thinking about this in terms of relationship building? Well... Uh, Alan Turing was a genius, right? But like most geniuses, he was incredibly socially awkward, incredibly socially awkward person. And so he did not understand the value of building relationships. And he he thought that he was going to get ahead by being smart, the smartest person in the room. And he typically was the smartest person in the room, but he couldn't get his coworkers, the people he was working with, to help break an unbreakable Nazi code. He couldn't get them to help him. In fact, they downright hated him. And he didn't understand this. He didn't understand this at all. And then one day he was out at the bar with Kira Knightley. I believe her name was June in the movie or Joan, something like that. But he was out at the bar with Kira Knightley. And she said to him, she gave him sage advice. She said, Alan, you need to get them to like you. And Alan listened to her because he trusted her. And so the next day, Alan goes into work and he he brings apples for every one of his coworkers. And, and he tries telling jokes to make his coworkers laugh, to make them like him. And he's still a horribly awkward person, but his coworkers can see that he's trying. And so a month later, or however long in the movie, when the boss comes and Alan still hasn't gotten his machine working and the boss tries to fire him because of it, you know what happens? His coworkers stuck up for him. And they said, if you fire Alan, you're going to have to fire us too. And so that leads me to my last point among principle number two. Do not wait until you need something to start building relationships. Do not wait. This is something you need to be doing on an ongoing basis. Because if you wait until you need something from someone to start building these relationships, you are going to be in an island by yourself. No one is going to be there to help you. So don't wait. Start doing this now. All right. That's principle number two. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to chat them in or let me know how I'm doing. Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys have all the, the funny names for Benedict Cumberbatch, but it is a good movie. Listen, I don't care what you think of the actor. That movie is fantastic. All right, let's move into principle number three. So how are we building those relationships? How are we building them? Well, you have to understand that people have different natural preferences and tendencies when it comes to the work environment. I'm going to say it another way. People are like cats and dogs. Now, I'm more of a dog person myself. Some of you follow me on social media. You know that these are my two little bastard dogs. I have a Chihuahua and a Chihuini. My Chihuahua's name is Honey Robocop Poncho Tequila. She answers to both Honey and Robocop. My Chihuini's name, and a Chihuini is a mix of a Dachshund and a Chihuahua. My Chihuini's name is Kobe Baratheon, first of his name, mostly because I really get a kick out of it when the vet has to call me for something and they have to say, I'm calling about Kobe Baratheon, first of his name. And it's like, it cracks me up every damn time. But I'm like, I'm like one of those dog people, okay? Like, if you follow me, especially like on Instagram, you're going to see me posting two things on Instagram. Well, maybe, maybe three now. But most of the things that I post on Instagram are related to knitting or dogs. That's it. Sometimes I post more dramatic posts now that more people know who I am, but knitting and dogs. So if you follow me on Instagram, you're going to see pictures like this of my husband balancing a beer on my dog's head or my dog showing off their new haircuts after they got them? Or how about a twofer in this one with my dog modeling my knitting, my other dog photobombing in the background? Or like why this picture of my dog hasn't gone viral on the internet yet? 
Like, I just don't understand. I don't understand. Maybe someone here can explain it to me. Like, why this picture of my dog has not gone viral on the internet yet? I don't get it. Here's my point with all of this. I don't understand cat people. I really don't. I used to have a cat when I was younger. I had two cats, actually, when I was a kid. Cats, like, basically hate you. There is, like, no redeeming value of a cat whatsoever. They just hang around, and they just want you to feed them and give them the catnip and milk. And, like, cats are, like, cats are, like, menopausal women that are constantly cranky and and like i just don't understand why why someone would prefer the love of a cat which basically hates you over the pure innocent childlike love of a dog i just don't get it myself however i don't think cat people are bad people I don't think they've made poor life choices, right? We just have different values. We have different values. And the same is true of different styles when it comes to work. California SOS says this looks like Ill and Omar. I don't disagree with that, California SOS. So the same is true when it comes to work. Now, most commonly when it comes to work, people make the mistake of thinking that our differences in work style are related to, to really broad categories of information. So one of the most common things that we think they're related to are extrovert or introvert. Where do you get your energy? And that, that does play a role, but it's not the whole story. And frankly, don't even get me started on generalizing about people based on the generation in which they were born into, it makes absolutely no sense to do this. Do not generalize based on generations because generations are like 20 year spans of time. And it is significantly more complicated to understand someone's work style, the natural preferences and tendencies that they bring to work. However, this is, this is what you need to do. Corliss actually asks a great question. Aren't communication styles why we did Myers-Briggs? Yeah. Excuse me. So Myers-Briggs is one of the tools that you can use. The MBTI is one of the tools that you can learn to um, understand people's work styles. I'm going to actually talk about a different tool in a second that I, I like even better than that. But our goal here, big picture, is that we've got to do a better job of understanding the work styles that people bring with them to the office. And then once we understand what people need, we need to adapt our behavior to those people. Now, the MBTI is a great tool for doing this. However, the tool that I actually like even better is the DISC profile, frankly, because the DISC profile is actually significantly more accurate than the MBTI. It's also much easier to teach, and it's much easier for the average person to remember what it is. But so DISC profile is is one option, and I administer those. I'm, I'm a I, I'm a DISC nerd I, on like a good day. I love this stuff. I think it's so, so valuable. But if you don't have a disc profile or don't know what, what uh, someone's disc type is, the next best thing is just to mirror them. It's to mirror what they're giving you. So, so for example, if you have a boss that all that boss ever sends over email is like really short, quick messages that are like in bullet points. Why would you write a paragraph back or two paragraphs back? Don't respond to that boss with like a big long email of information because if, if they're writing to you constantly, most of their emails are just bullet points, like very quick and to the point. Do not respond with a huge paragraph of information because if you do that, what's going to happen? Their head's going to explode when they see it. They aren't going to read it. It's too much. Um, okay, so Kaiser Sose asks... Is it true that people who are feeling on Myers-Briggs, um, on the Myers-Briggs instead of intuitive are NPCs? No, I mean, listen, like the feeling one on Myers-Briggs, this is actually why I don't like Myers-Briggs. It's like, that is not a reliable measurement for that specific thing. So I don't even put any, cre like, like any credence in that because it has a test retest liability of something like 40%. What that means is that if you take the Myers-Briggs on a Monday and then you take it again on a Friday, there's only a 40% chance that you're going to get like the same answer because it's a really low test retest reliability it can change based on, based on um, how you're feeling that day for that reason. So I wouldn't put too much credence in the Myers-Briggs for that, for that specific purpose. All right. So our goal here, whether it's through DISC, 
maybe attempting a Myers-Briggs if you're feeling softy, uh, saucy or mirroring the person, our goal here is to understand the emotional needs of our coworkers so we can adapt our behavior to them. Because once we understand those emotional needs, that's when you can start to engage in a different way. And listen, some other strategies for understanding what your coworkers need from you. These are gonna seem deceptively simple, but they're deceptively simple because so many people don't do them. So here's the first one. Listen, 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 listen. Listen guys, li waiting to talk and listening are not the same thing. They are not the same thing. You have to practice active listening with your coworkers. 88% of people says of all the things that they want from their coworkers is they want people who will listen to them. And they say that because that same probably 88% of people are convinced that no one is listening to them. If you listen to your coworkers, really like, you know, kind of put your own ego aside for a second and listen deeply to what they're saying, they will tell you what they want. They will tell you every single time. So, so that's something we need to do. Um, Dragon Water asks, is there a good place to get your disc assessment cheaply? Yeah. So the disc assessments, I've got two disc assessments that I use that I trust. Um, the disc assessment that I, that is of this image, that one is going to be about a hundred dollars. So that's not exactly a cheap way to go. But if you go to rallybright.com, and sign up for a profile on there. I think that's like 20 bucks right now. And I actually wrote the Rally Bright disc. So, um, so that would be a good place to go. That's rallybright.com. All right. Um, so we talked about listening. You want to make sure you're doing that. Hang on, guys. I'm just trying to get everything situated on my screen so I can see the chat. Um, so listening number one, what do you want to do after you listen to them? You want to have their back. Have their back. This is, again, one of those things that's so often misunderstood in organizations because having someone's back, it is a binary thing, right? People either believe that you have their back or they believe that you don't. And the default is not to trust someone. Think Again, just apply this to your own experience. The default is not to trust someone. If, you, if someone does not believe that you have their back, that you're going to be there to back them up and to help them and to support them when things go wrong, then they believe that you do not have their back. So you want to be that person that people trust, the pe person that's going to show up, the person that's going to support them. This takes extra work right? But it will pay you back in spades when you're talking about office politics influencing, what, like very brass tax here, guys. Someone is significantly more likely to do you a favor if you have previously done a favor for them. It is that simple. That simple. Paul asks, thank you for the super chat, Paul. I like cats because they are independent. Dogs are way too needy. Same with people. What does that say about me? Well, it probably says you're conservative and you want people to take personal responsibility for what they're doing in the world, um, which is perfectly fair. Perfectly fair. Hey, man, again, I don't think cat people are bad people. I just, I prefer, you know, maybe... Maybe this is the liberal in me coming out, right? I prefer to have something that needs me and that I can take care of and that I can pet and preen on and all that stuff. All right, so we're going to listen. We're going to have people's backs. The last thing I want you to think about when we're talking about building relationships, and this is especially hard now, man, I get it. Stop relying on email. Stop it. No, really, stop it. You know, email is great. Email is great for a lot of things. Email is great for, email is great for, um, hang on. Ah, trying to get my screen situated. Email is great for like scheduling meetings. Email is great for like passing documents back and forth. Email might be great for a little note saying, you know, just, you know, I'm five minutes late, get the meeting started without me, stuff like that. You know what email is not great for? Anything that could be considered a human interaction. It, it sucks for those things because it takes away our voice. It takes away someone even seeing you as a human being. And the same is true for Slack. The same is true for Teams. Any of your little virtual tools that you're working with right now, you want to as much as you can. Get on the phone, get on a video call, get on Zoom, things like that. So that's what you want to be using in these circumstances because we do not emotionally engage with technology. We simply don't do it. It's the way it works. Let's see. Rudiger has a question. 
Loving these questions, guys, by the way. I'm a conservative in a liberal environment. How do I check my power level in relation to office politics? I mean, I wouldn't, I guess what I would say is like, don't worry about being a conservative in a liberal environment. Worry about relationship building. Worry about understanding what people want. Worry about understanding their perspective. Worry about building these relationships with them by, by building the trust that we've been talking about. And like, what I know about conservatives too is listen, this is like right up your alley because what this is is about taking responsibility for your experience at work, taking responsibility for what you are contributing. All right. Now, I do have one more tip about this one though. And this one's going to be the hardest one for all my conservative friends. It's going to be the hardest one for you. So get ready for it. I also want to recommend that you embrace vulnerability in the office. Embrace vulnerability. Mm. Again, that same 50% of you that when I said you need to engage with emotions, that same 50% of you that were like, no, like you just did the same thing here. I know, I get it. What do I mean by vulnerability? Well, I'm going to tell you a little story. So I used to work, I used to work for a public radio station, guys, believe it or not. Someday I'll tell you guys this story. I used to work for a public radio station and it was a shitty place to work and I hated it. And I hated it for so, so many reasons. Um, one of the reasons that I was having a hard time with it is because I there was this one dude that I was working with. He was a lot older than me. He didn't understand me. I was like this young little upstart. He didn't understand me. And he and I were like, pick, 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 back and forth all day. We we're being very, very passive aggressive. This is actually around the time I developed this presentation, by the way, is when I was in this horrible, toxic working environment. So yeah, Rudiger says, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I get it, man. Um, so I was in this horrible, toxic working environment. And what happened is one day I was in a meeting with this dude that I was having this passive aggressive back and forth with for months, for months, this was going on. But we were in a meeting one day and with like 12 other people, because this is the way this always works out. And he just unloaded on me in the middle of the meeting, just unloaded on me in front of like 12 other people. And so I was pissed. I'm going to be honest. I was absolutely pissed. And so I sat there like this, the whole rest of the meeting with that glare of death on my face. And as soon as it was over, I got up, I stomped out of the building, stomped out of it. It was like right before lunch. And then, and I drove down the street and I went to Buffalo Wild Wings where it was boneless wing Thursday. And I had a big plate of Buffalo wings and a very, very tall beer very tall beer. And I sat there and I ate my buffalo wings. And I drank my beer till I was good and ready to go back to the office. And so I did that. Now the beer may not have been like my best all time choice. Because when I got back to the office, like I was still fighting, I was still like ready to go. I was like, you want more motherfucker? Like, come on, come on. And I stomped over to his office, shut the door, looked at him in the face and said, what is your problem? And the way he looked at me in that moment, when I was ready to call him out, I knew that it had nothing to do with me. I realized seeing the look on his face that his outburst in that meeting that was directed towards me had absolutely nothing to do with me. And in that moment, we, we had a conversation and we talked about how he was struggling, how he was getting it from every corner of the organization, how he was constantly feeling put upon, how he was constantly being put down by everyone. And I told him the same thing because I was experiencing exactly the same thing as he was. And we were both displayed vulnerability. That's what we did. We brought our guard down. We brought the wall down and we had a conversation and we were vulnerable in that conversation. And that vulnerability allowed us to see the struggle that the other person was having. And so in the course of that conversation, like there were tears, there may have been a hug at the end of it. Um, now we still, we still didn't really understand each other. He was still like an old curmudgeonly dude. And I was like this young uppity, you know, upstart. And we didn't always understand each other. But from that point forward, our working relationship was 8,000 times better. And, and, you know, I wasn't at that organization for very much longer. I'll tell you guys all that story another time. Uh, but, and I trust me, it's a good story. You want to hear this story. But for the time that I was there, it made things so much easier. And that was because we had developed psychological safety with one another. Psychological safety is basically your propensity to trust the people on your team. Have, we've already talked about having someone's back, right? When you have someone's back, you are helping them to feel 
psychologically safe in that work environment. So you know what the one of the biggest problems in the work environment is? Actually, I'm gonna ask you guys to guess if you're still paying attention in the chat. What do you think one of the biggest problems in the work environment is for people getting that gets in the way of people's ability to be successful? What do you think is the biggest problem that gets in the way of people's ability to be successful at work? Go ahead, chat in your answers. Well, I actually clear my throat because I'm losing my voice. Communication, Mallory says, communication. Dragon Water says, people being treated unfairly. Rudiger says, trust. Um, Digital Bros says, treating, taking things personally. Sovereign Pariah says, trying to be open without stomping on people. Responsibility, envy. Yeah, some of you are kind of waffling around it. So I'm going to share this with you, and I don't think you're going to be surprised when I share it. So the biggest problem that usually stands in the way of people being successful is a sense of powerlessness is that people feel powerless in the office. How many of you, and just type into the chat if you feel comfortable, how many of you have ever felt powerless at work? That there was just nothing you could do to be successful. The whole thing was working against you. Have people felt powerless at work before? Yeah. If you're like most people, you have. I mean, think about it, man. Like most people who work in a normal office environment, they can't even purchase like a $200 office chair that's going to help them feel more comfortable without going through like 19 levels of red tape, right? Yeah, so you guys are saying like, I feel powerless all the time. This is the biggest problem you're going to encounter in the office. And most people feel powerless. This is what I really want you to understand is that most of your coworkers probably feel exactly the same way. So if you want to, if you want to build better relationships with them, what is one of the best things you can do to make them feel really good? And more importantly, to make them feel really good in relation to you, give them their power back, make it part of your goal, make it part of, of the way that you operate at work is one of your missions in your work life is to give your coworkers, their power back. And that's what I did. When I was in that horrible, toxic environment at the public radio station, I actually wrote this, this mantra that is still my mantra to this day, by the way. Um, and I wrote it on a sticky note. I stuck it to my computer monitor. I wrote it on my giant whiteboard, all this stuff. And my mantra was act with integrity, show compassion and empathy, even when others don't, and be of service to people around you. And it was in that service, in that service that I, that I was able to, you know, at least keep my sanity in the toxic working environment that I was in. Because if I did these three things every single day, then I considered that to be a successful day. And it didn't matter what else happened. Every single day I went into the office and I, I tried to act with integrity, have compassion and empathy, and be of service to people around me. And even in a toxic work environment, it really did make all the difference. And so write your mantra. You can steal mine if you want. I don't really care. But like write your mantra. And then you do it and you follow it even if, even if it's outside of your job description. And the words, that's not my job, are some of the absolute most toxic words in the work environment. You do these things because they're the right thing to do, not because it's part of the official job description that you have. You know, a lot of people say the golden rule is to treat other people the way you want to be treated, right? I want to make a little modification to that. I think it's about treating other people the way they want to be treated. And because how they want to be treated might be differently than how you want to be treated. And when you do that, that's when you can bring them along with you and get their glorious, glorious buy-in. All right, guys, if you have any questions so far, please feel free to chat them in. I'm going to keep going because this is already running a little bit long. So I'm going to keep going. But remember, if you have questions, chat them in um, and I will do my very, very best. Actually, let me just check in on locals to see if anyone's posted any additional questions there. Real quick, doesn't look like they have. Guys, if you're in the locals community, please make sure you're posting under the playing politics post. It's, it's tagged right at the top. Um, and if you aren't, just ask it here and, and I'll do my very best. All right, so that brings us to principle number four of office politics. 
always look for the win-win. So back in the day, when I was first researching for this presentation, I came across this post on LinkedIn. And it was written by this guy, Robbie, who looked like kind of a bro. And I was like, Ugh, what does this guy even have to say about office politics? But I read the post anyway. It's called How to Win at Office Politics Every Damn Time. And I got down to the bottom tip number 10 that he gave. And he he kind of like, he said, um, he said, there are only losers in office politics, never winners. And I was like, dude, you just lived up to your picture admirably, because that is exactly the wrong answer. That is exactly the wrong answer. Because when you play office politics well, there are only winners. Because you being successful does not mean that you have to look for ways to defeat other people. What you should be doing is looking for ways for every single person to have some sort of a win. Another word for that is compromise. Compromise, the lost, the lost art of the compromise. Because listen, compromising is essentially when you give up a little bit of what you want and in order to give someone else a win. Listen, guys, it is better every single day of the week, every single day to get maybe 70 or even 60 or even 50% of what you want in a given situation and to give someone else a win than it is to get 100% of what you want in a situation and to piss someone else off. Every single day, it is better to get a little bit of what you want and to give someone else a win than 100% of what you want and to piss someone else off. And I said that twice because it's really important because people, when you piss them off, they remember that for years. For years, they remember that. Paul says, I call out BS at work because it's because we all feel it, but there's no there, but no one will actually call it out. It's okay to call out BS at work, Paul, but you've got to do it in a strategic way. If you're just calling out BS to be a dick or to be that guy that's pointing it out, that's not going to be successful. But there are ways you can call out BS at work where you're going to be a lot more successful. And again, maybe thinking about this way to compromise could be the best thing for you. Now, has anyone ever seen this guy give a talk? I know a lot of you probably don't like him very much, but but the thing is, like, I've actually, I've seen him give a talk before. I saw him at South by Southwest a couple years ago. He's actually really smart. He really is. He's really smart. He, I was absolutely shocked. And what he said, he was talking about trying to fix healthcare in California. And they were ultimately unsuccessful at that. But what he said about his attempt at it and how they came together was really smart. And he said what he essentially did was bringing all stakeholders uh, uh, that had a, a stake in healthcare in California, he brought them all into the same room together. And he started off the conversation saying, not a single one of you should expect to get a 10 walking out of this meeting. The best you should expect for is a seven, is to get a seven out of 10. Because if you if you get a 10, that means that guy over there is getting a three. And that's when it all falls apart. So that was really good advice. Shoot for a seven out of 10. Shoot for 70% of what you want. Now, the reason that this strategy fell apart is because the people in the room didn't listen to his advice and everyone started battling and having these power struggles over who was going to get the 10, right? That's when the entire thing fell apart. So in order to give someone else a win, one of the things you need to do is to understand their motivations, understand what's driving them, understand what is getting them to make the emotional decisions that they're making. And a lot of people think that, um, that, that you know, a lot of the decisions that people make, oftentimes it has to do with fear. How many of you have ever heard in relation to work or anything else, people are afraid of change? How many of you believe that people are afraid of change? Go ahead, chat in. Oh my God. I really hope my voice is going to survive this. Does anyone think that people are afraid of change? I know there's a little bit of a delay between when I speak and you guys actually talk. Okay. So oftentimes people think that, um, that they can't get someone to do something simply because they don't want to do it differently. But it's actually a little bit more in depth than that. Rogue says, I'm afraid of change. You're probably not though. You're probably not. Listen, things change around us all the time. Listen, we are living in a time of great change. <laughs> I mean, just in, just in what we're doing. But things change around us all the time and people aren't usually running down the street, right? Um, Kaiser Sose says change terrifies people. It's not the change that does. 
It's the loss. That's the real thing that's motivating it, is the loss. What am I going to lose if things change? What, what processes am I going to lose that I'm responsible for? What power am I going to lose that I previously had if things change? That's what their motivation is. What are people losing? So when you're thinking about looking for ways to compromise, you have to look and really try to figure out what your colleagues think they are losing. And it's also better to know who is an ally in your office and who is an enemy. And when I say ally and enemy, this is not about thinking about who you like and who you don't like. This is about thinking about whose goals align with yours and whose do not. Because here's the thing. In any sort of work environment, there is a finite pot of resources. There is one big pot of resources that everyone is trying to take advantage of, whether that be money, team members, things like that, resources, things like that. One big pot that everyone's going for. Your allies are the people that want to do the same things with those resources that you want to do. Your enemies are the people who want to do different things with those resources. This is not about who you like. This is not about your office BFF. So you want to really know who are your enemies, who wants to take the resources that you want and to do different things with them than what you think is the best, because those are the people you really need to win over. The allies you want to get on your team, the enemies are the people you have to win over. So how do you win over your enemies? Well, I really like quoting dead people. So let's look at Sun Tzu. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. Or even better, this one I like even better. Build your enemy a golden bridge to retreat across. And so what does that mean? When it comes to making friends and influencing people at work, what does that mean? It means once you figure out who your enemies are and you figure out what they want, you give it to them. You find a way to give it to them. That is the root of a compromise, is you give other people a win. Even if it hurts you, even if you really don't want to do it because you really don't like that person, this is how you're going to build those relationships. And guess what, folks? When you give your enemies wins over and over and over again, they stop being your enemy because they start seeing you as someone that is a reasonable person to work with. And so if you keep, keep handing out those wins, listen, what's going to happen the first time you do it is they're going to look at you like you have three heads. They're going to look at you and be like, what the hell's going on? Like, this person doesn't like me. This person's never said nice words to me. Why are they being nice to me? What do they want? Okay, that they're going to approach you with suspicion the first time you do it, but you do it again, you do it again, you do it again after that, and eventually they will stop being your enemy. Now, in order to do that, we have to get into principle number five. And principle number five is all about picking your battles. Because political capital at work is not finite, but it is fluid. And what that means is that if you use all of your political capital, all of your goodwill to fight battles that do not matter, that means you may not have any left over when, when, um, when you really need it. Ruhan says, this is a good question. Ruhan says, but how do I give the limited resources? Wouldn't people take advantage? Well, they might take advantage. Or, um, or you might actually get a new ally and you guys come together and, and figure out ways to do even more. You know, people will, when you're being generous, when you're being altruistic, sometimes it, sometimes people will take advantage. That, that's absolutely true. But you don't want to let your fear of that happening prevent you from, from trying to build those relationships, trying to create that goodwill. Um, all right. So you want to make sure you're using your political capital when it matters most. And oftentimes, guys, the best thing you can do, really, you have to be aware of what battles are worth fighting, because oftentimes the very best thing you can do is to keep your mouth shut. That is oftentimes, if you look at a meeting, if you look at, think about this with any meeting that you've been in. Oftentimes, the most powerful people in that room are the people that say the least. 
the people that say the least, because they don't have to. They are picking their battles. They're going after the things that are important. And if something is not important, there's so much bickering and so much nonsense that takes place in any work environment simply because people are fighting battles that are not important. And guess what? That takes place on the internet too, doesn't it? I bet, I bet, you know, Sovereign says silence is golden. Yeah, silence is golden, man. Because just because someone is wrong does not mean you need to point out that they're wrong. You have to ask yourself, what am I winning here? What is the goal here? What am I trying to achieve here? And oftentimes, the very best thing you can do if you find yourself getting heated is to take a step back. Just take a second. If you find yourself getting fired up, if you find yourself like ready to go, if you find yourself like I sometimes do, because I love a good debate, I love a good fight, just take a minute because in the work environment, those little nonsense fights can really, really cost you. Just take a minute, breathe, ask yourself, is this really important? Is this really a battle that I want to fight? Because you might not want to do that. You might not want to expend your political capital doing that. You know, passion is a great thing. Passion is awesome. But too much passion can actually be a weakness. So just breathe. Ask yourself, does this meet my high-level goals? This is some advice my mentor gave me about, you know, oh, gosh, 15 years ago, something like that now. She said, Carlin, because I used to be, guys, can I make a confession? Like, I used to be a bitch. I was a bitch to work with. I really was. And and so my mentor took me aside one day and she was like, Carlin, everyone knows you're smart. You don't have to prove that. But it's not about being right. It's about being effective. And she's absolutely right. It is not about being the smartest person in the room. It's about doing what is most effective in the room. And listen, guys, sometimes when you keep your mouth shut, it may feel to you like you're taking no for an answer. But just because you don't fight that particular battle doesn't mean you can't get what you want. It just means you have to fight for it in a different way because you can always get what you want, but maybe not in exactly the way you anticipated doing it. So just keep in mind that just because you know the answer is no right now doesn't mean the answer is no tomorrow or the next day or next month or next year. You don't always keep fighting these battles. If something is important to you, keep fighting, but be strategic about how you're doing it. All right, guys, to wrap up this presentation just in time, um, with great power comes with great responsibility. So the techniques that I've taught you in this presentation, they can be used to do evil things. People use playing, people use office politics to do evil things all the time. We don't want to do that, though. We want to use these strategies for good. And that's up to you. You can use to use these strategies, you can choose to use these strategies for good or you can choose to use these strategies for evil. But I'm gonna recommend you use them for good because honestly, it is a whole lot better. It is so much more pleasant. So to, to leave off, use this information to build more human connections. Use it to be more empathetic, to be more flexible, to be more likable, be a little bit vulnerable, know when to keep your mouth shut, and to balance good relationships with doing good work, because that is all about what office politics is at the end of the day. All right, guys, that is the full presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Let me know in the chat what you thought. If you have any questions, now is the time to chat them in. I'll hang around for a couple more minutes um, and take some questions and then see, see if there's any other way I can help you guys. Listen, I am doing all my presentations virtually right now, given what's going on in the world. If you're interested in me speaking at your event or to your group, head over to zenworkplace.com slash speaking, get in touch. We'll have a conversation. You can also contact me directly at drcarlin.com. There's a contact form, super simple. And just a reminder, if you got value in what I did today, please consider supporting my work because it really does make a difference. Um, you can join me on Locals, kb.locals.com, where you can get my ad-free videos every day. 
every video I post here on YouTube is posted ad-free on Locals. Use the promo code WELCOME to get your first month for free. You can also support me on Subscribestar, and you can support me by getting merchandise, like really cool merchandise in my store, including this brand new mask that I just love. I can't wait to get mine, honestly. And um, there is a sale going on through Teespring right now where if you use that code, uh, you're going to get 10% off. So that's all I've got for right now, guys. And I'm just going to look in the chat and see if anyone has any questions. And again, let me know what you thought of the presentation because... This is a little experiment for me. I don't actually know if you guys are going to respond to these, but, you know, I hope you enjoyed it. I don't know. It's fun to give. It's fun for me to kind of, like, keep on my toes while I'm not doing in-person presentations. Sovereign says, yeah, it doesn't matter what you know. It matters uh, who you can persuade. I think that's a really great... That's a really great point. It's about who you can persuade and how you can persuade them. It doesn't matter how smart you are a lot of the times. Um, Sovereign also asks, how do you give power back when the buck stops with you and the subordinates are near incompetent? Well, you got to coach the coordinates, the subordinates. You have to coach them. You have to coach them to develop them. Um, listen, coaching and coaching re really helps uh, subordinates to develop skill sets. Coaching is a whole other thing unto itself. That is a different presentation. But if the, if your subordinates are incompetent, you know, I got some bad news, man. That's your fault. Your job as a manager is to develop them. Make them competent. <laughs> Making connections is going to be hard. I know it's hard, dude, but I'm wor it's worth it. I promise you. I promise you it's worth it. Mallory says, I really enjoyed the presentation and learned a lot that I will start to use in life. Thank you, Mallory. I hope you do. Let me know how it goes. Actually, I'm just going to put the Locals thing up on the screen because that's really the most important thing. Guys, I really do hope you join me on Locals. Like, I think I th I'm i really looking forward to the community there. We're going to be doing a book club soon. It's going to be next month. We're going to read the book Conversations with God and do a little live chat about it. I'm very, very excited. Uh, we have discussions there every single day. So please consider joining it. All right. Thank you, Sovereign. All right, so it looks like the chat is kind of dying down, So, and I am really losing my voice. I'm shocked I made it through that. So I'm going to cut the live stream now, but again, I hope you really enjoyed it. I hope to see you on Locals. Uh, use the promo code WELCOME to, to get free a free month. Rudiger says, anything new in knitting? Not really, honestly. Like Knitting is kind of quiet right now, but I am working on my Knitting Wars series of videos, so at least you'll be able to enjoy the drama from the past. Nothing's really going on right now, I don't think. Not that I've seen. All right, guys. I hope you have a great rest of your day. I'm going to go take it easy. And I will, I will see you around on the YouTubes and the Twitters and all those things. Thank you very much for attending. And I hope, I hope you enjoyed it.